Hi everyone, in this video I'd like to introduce the proof of existence and uniqueness of the first order linear differential equations in standard form. In, in ap many application problems, the, the problem is formulated in this way, first order linear differential equation in standard form. So understanding its, its in existence and uniqueness is important to accept the mathematical solution as a definite and solution of the physical problem. So here we focus on the logic, especially the logic on the uniqueness and some of the motivation, especially the operation we're doing to the equations and what operation we're doing doesn't have to be justified. You can do any operation to give an equation as long as this is, um, that is valid. So we're going to focus on this logical development and not giving you the detail of why we're doing that particular operation to that. But I will briefly mention where this is coming from. If you have learned the me method so far, and that's everything is related back to that. So here is the first order linear differential equation. The reason it's called linear, we probably have a discussed what a standard form is. Standard form, you can isolate y prime nicely, that's possible here. The reason it's called linear is that left-hand side is obtained by linear operation on the unknown function y, and px is known function. And right-hand side is just a function in terms of x. So the mainly linear comes from a linear operation done on the unknown function y here. So this if I give you any function y, not necessarily the solution of this one, any function of y, differentiate it, and add this px times that uh, original function yx, this is kind of operation we do that given function yx. That operation satisfies certain um, property called linearity, so that's what, what is called linear. I mentioned earlier what we do here is focus on its a validity of the one statement to the next statement. We establish the validity on that part, not necessarily justifying why we're doing this, but justifying what we're doing is absolutely correct. So here's some setup you might encounter um, this a lot in mathematics textbook. They just set things up and not sometimes explain where they're coming from. So it starts like this, but I'd like to um, uh, relate back to the exact uh, a differential equation in differential form that is not exact, then the way we solve that is computing the integrating factor. So you can turn this one into differential equation in differential form, not in the standard form, and can get this integrating factor kicks in. So we realize that if you actually go back in here and use this integrating factor here just to prove the logical development is a little bit less work than dealing with the actual full differential form. So I hope this is reminiscent to you that we're integrating this function from non-exact differential form equation. So that's where it's come from. When, whenever we prove, if possible, try to avoid ambiguity. For example, this seems like an antiderivative little px. Here I'm using definite integral, where c is some definitely given number. So this is not an antiderivative. It's a very specific antiderivative. This is definite integral. Start from c and x. Whenever x is given, this is a function. But if you just say an antiderivative little px, there are many antiderivatives. And those two trained people, they'll be able to tell whether it's OK or not. But if possible, try to be specific in the proof that leaves out any doubt. So here's px. Given this information, it's specifically defined. And then ix is this e raised to px. And what is this thing? I hope you um, remember how this integrating factor thing works. This came from there. So if we multiply this one to the left-hand side, right-hand side, this perfect integral part arises naturally. Remember, this is only a setup um, for, uh, before we actually begin our logical development. So the logic starts right here. Suppose yx is a solution. yx is a solution to this initial value problem. And we want to develop logically, and especially very rigorously, such that yx must be in this form. And then you will see at the end that 
um, yx must be in this form. The candidate is actually a very specific function. So it leaves no possibility, but it has to be that. So y is actually a solution to this one. And we're going to do this operation on that and kind of narrow it down the possibility of yx. yx is a solution. Of course, it satisfied this equation. So I turn that dy into dx. So it's better to hide that factor, so I did that. So dy dx is y prime. The px multiplied to the yx. And qx is there. So this, of course, satisfied. This is a solution to that. Then we're doing operation on that. If this is true, if we multiply this factor e to the px everywhere, that y must satisfy this equation too. So this that that function is it's in this uh, world. So I back to the, um, this form where things are multiplied. So y x is still there. Let me be a little bit extreme there. So. You know, if we don't explain anything about where this guy's coming from, why don't I just grab some arbitrary function here, like let's say qx, and multiply qx, qx, and qx? Then it is true that yx still satisfy. Be extreme that just becomes zero, zero function. Multiply zero, 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 zero is zero. There is no zero is zero. That is true. Especially there is no statement about y of x. So it is still true. Y of x is there, and we are saying zero equals zero. So there's nothing wrong about that. Of course, we don't want to be that extreme. This is a good mu multiplication so that it reveals a secret. So again, not justifying why we're doing this, but just to focus on um, one statement from the next statement, and it's rigorously developed. Next thing is a key thing that you have to think about. If this is statement is true, next operation, this operation is something you multiply both sides by the same thing. You've been doing that all your life. Um, as long as you are in math classes. Next operation is more sophisticated. Left hand side here is a function, and right hand side here is a function. We're going to do some functional operator. If you integrate left hand side from c to x, if you integrate that one from c to x, if they're identically the same function, of course this integral function will be the same. Notice that I switch this x's to integral variable u and that u then integrated from c to x. Again, it's not indefinite integral. Some definite integral, so that leaves out no ambiguity. This is very specific thing we're doing. Then, under this operation, of course, left-hand side and right-hand side, as a function of x, it's going to be the same. So what I'm doing here in the next part, it's some throwing in some additional information. So this is absolutely true. We're going to discover some other information, such that this thing can be rewritten. Okay? So here I copy this entire thing uh, down here, and it seems like um, I wanted to rewrite this expression as a derivative of something. Think about what this statement is saying. This inside it here is written here, and try to rewrite this one identically equal to derivative of something. That's exactly antiderivative of this function. That's a derivative being there. Going backwards, that's the antiderivative. So I'm about to discover an antiderivative so that I can do this integral. So how would you do this integral if you have to justify um, your method? You will go through integration by parts. If you look at it here, and if you apply integration by part, you'll be able to discover what goes here. Just do the integration by part on that part. It turns out it cancels the other part of something works out nicely. Okay? So you will discover that part here. But just for the sake of writing the correct proof, not justifying everything we do, we just have to verify that the antiderivative we have found here is correct. So you went through that anti the integration by part met method, which is messy. Well, we'll make this entire line of logic messy, but you just justify Okay, what I found is this one, e to the pu times y is very simple. If you actually differentiate this function, you will get this one back. So this is a perfect proof of the antiderivative of this one is that, that one. Not showing uh, how I discover that. The, the way we discover this one is through the method of integration by part. But if you just have to justify what you're doing is correct, this will suffice.
So do this chain rule on that and product rule, you'll be able to discover this one. So if you begin begin to develop going backward of this one, like doing the product rule backward, that's that's a good thing to have. That's something you I want you to develop in this differential equation course. So hope you believe this is correct. So I can rewrite this entire thing in here with that symbol. We have antiderivative. So I rewrote this entire thing, identical expression. It says the inside function has antiderivative of this one. So this part you have to understand. If this is true, this statement is absolutely true. Here we're using a fundamental theorem of calculus. If you know the antiderivative of the entire thing here, what is antiderivative of this one? We just noticed that this is an antiderivative. So I can use that antiderivative and subtract this one. This is um, how you compute the definite interval using the fundamental theorem of calculus. So if I just work on just that part, that'll be that you plug in x in there, so epxyx minus c. So px was uh, the uh, some antiderivative, the specified antiderivative. So this is uh, something we'll be able to compute. Right hand side, this is nothing known. X is the main variable. P and Q is something we um, know. So this is definitely completely understood. Only thing that is uh, we are focusing on is yx part. There's no y prime anymore, just yx. So if you're here, isolate yx, moving everything else to the other side, you arrive at here. That yx we started, we just assumed that's a solution. It must be in this form e to the negative px known, an integral from c known to x, e p y q i no u known, and everything here is known. So y had no choice. It must be in that form in this logical development. So that's the proof of the uniqueness. Now proving the existence, and I will allow in this part just to state the reversible, the, all the arguments are reversible, therefore the um, existence. But sometimes you have to be more careful with existence and um, we have to just rely on our common sense that if anybody agrees that reversibility somewhere is not so obvious, then you have to state that. So it's where to draw this line of you know the trivial part and non-trivial part depends on students level and everything. But here we will just examine reversibility and and actually um, let's together agree upon the triviality of the reversibility of the argument. So that's the end of the proof of uniqueness. All right, let's examine the um, existence. There is, we start from right here, there is this y-ax defined like this. So forget about everything that preceded before. We start with this y-ax, it's defined like this. See if it is clearly defined. We know px, which is antiderivative of px, that's part of our preparation. That we keep, but all the logical development, you have to forget about it for a while. And we have, um, sorry about the mistake, I should have replaced this yc with a in there. Sorry about this mistake, we have to go back to the end of the uniqueness theorem, that was yc, that's kind of weird that y is defined in terms of y, that's, that's an equation, it's not a good definition. So you have to replace that yc with the initial condition a. Okay, So I was rushing, I admit that, but you shouldn't be. When you prove something, you have to be clearly, um, you have to be clear about everything. So now back to the, the beginning of this existence theorem, we have that preparation at the beginning, calculation is capital Px. Then think of, uh, look at this definition, yx. This is epx, and here everything is given. A is a part of the conditions at the beginning. So here, right-hand side, is a completely given information. We start with the yx and show why this one satisfy the equation. All right, so let's reverse the statement. If this is true, certainly this statement is true. Why? Because it's simply rearrangement, right? Yx, uh, you multiply e to the px both sides and subtract the rest of the part in here. Only thing you have to justify is that yc. 
Wi-Fi plug in a YC, this whole thing becomes Y of C, the whole thing becomes an A. So if I plug in Y of C there, X equals C, it will go from C to C. This whole thing is going to be zero. So what about C here? And that's the constant. If you plug in C here, it's e to the negative PC. So these two cancel when X equals C. So with Y of C, it says that the value is A. So we can replace that y, um, A here with the YC. So that's why we can go back in here. So it's not completely trivial. There is something to do that was actually interesting to verify this one as actually Y of C of A. That didn't have to be the part of the uniqueness proof. OK? So we verify that. We can move things around. And there is supposed to be A in there, but we can replace with YC, such that we realize that Y of C here is equal to A. So that's exactly um, written like this. And by fundamental theorem calculus, this is, again, um, the exactly value of that. And this is just a copy. So here, this is where we are so far. Y axis is defined down there like that. And we were able to conclude that that yx will satisfy this condition. There's no yx, but if you plug it in here and differentiate it and everything, then it's going to be uh, satisfying this condition. And I realize you don't have to go through all the step here. You can go to this sta statement quickly. So you have, you're looking at this statement here. All you have to do is differentiate left-hand side and right-hand side with respect to x. So we're going to have the ddx here and ddx there. It is also the part of the fundamental theorem of calculus that if you have ddx, an integral from c to x, ddx integral from c to x, these two operators will cancel. So you can go the statement that this equals that inside without any um, integral operator. So if you unfold this ddu, you will get exactly like this, which is you know stated here. So if you unfold this one, that's exactly this one with the u in it. If you unfold that one, actually x in it, that's what the fundamental theorem calculus says. This replaces uh, replaced by x, so that's what you get. So going from here to there is hitting the left hand side, right hand side with the ddx and you get to right here. From here to the original equation is simply canceling this e to the px, which is allowed because e to the px is never zero. So we have that. And you can conclude that yx is a solution because we have to you cancel it. And this is showing up, and that's satisfied. And at the very beginning, we saw that yc was a already. So we could reverse this entire argument. There was a couple of spot you wanted to definitely um, state. So I will state it here. I will state it here at the bottom where we reversed it on, and uh, proving this one. So uh, we're going to verify y of c is a. And the reversibility was trivial using the fundamental theorem calculus, something like that. So we're going to end the exist proof of the existence like this. You're going to state that y of c using this formula. You first state let y of x like this. Then check that y of c is really a. Here's a check mark. And then why is this to satisfy the differential equation? Is that you're going backward. So you look at each of part. Reversibility of this one-way implication is kind of trivial if you use fundamental theorem of calculus along the way. And that proved uh, the end of the proof. Thanks.